I finally got started on my acanthus leaf packets, which are my last internal elements to cut before I have my background packet, but sand shading will come before that. So the next video after this one will probably be sand shading of the internal elements. And I still have some bits and pieces to do for the background packets for this one because they're a bit uh, unusual. So I'll try to show as much of that as I can. So not too much different in this video as opposed to the previous one. Um, just still working on trying to lengthen the saw stroke and improve my control. I was pretty happy with the cutting on this. The quality was about the same as in the last video. So no big improvements. There's a turn. Kind of a sloppy one because I overshot. I went a little too far past the element, but it was going into the background packet, so no problem. So I had to cut back up a little bit when I made my turn on that one. I should be getting some new camera equipment too, so hopefully that'll help out with some of these close-up shots. There's another turn, so I can get a nice 90 degree corner down there. Yeah, all in all, the cutting went good on these. Um, I was able to maintain a pretty good saw stroke for most of it. There were a couple of tiny pieces on here where I started getting focused on hitting the line a little more than focusing on the, the stroke, so it shortened up in a few spots. But overall, pretty good. There's another hole there so I can make another sharp turn. In this video, you'll see something that I alluded to previously, where uh, sometimes the moisture from your left hand can start to cause problems. So in a couple areas, the paper will actually uh, come undone on the screen. You'll be able to see it. So the motif will actually start to come off the packet. So there's a couple things that you can try to do uh, to combat that. And you'll see it when, whenever that pops up. There is a bit of a difference between this veneer and what I was working with previously. Before I was working with Saint Gabon Ebony from France, from Le Fille de Georges. And this material is actually a sliced veneer. So the material itself is actually uh, a lot more fragile than the Saint veneer. So you have to be a bit more careful as you cut this. It's a little more prone to breaking and crumbling. Quick adjustment in the blade there, so I don't track properly. Same thing on this video as the previous, I cut out a lot of the transitions. So as I started cutting this packet, because it's sliced veneer, it's actually easier to saw through it. Um, as far as uh, the amount of pressure being able to cut the packet. So the same amount of pressure here will actually cut more distance than on the previous packet, if that makes sense. Um, that can be good and bad. For me, that usually tends to be bad because it means that uh, the blade goes faster during the cut. So you have to work on the control a lot more. So these first few pieces, I was uh, in some spots leaving the line a little fat and then going back and shaving so it wasn't as smooth as with the ebony packet but after a few pieces i got used to it in this video too i'm more so cutting odd bits and pieces so not too many things that you'll actually recognize as acanthus leaf parts most of these are bits of uh, flower stems you can see there coming up on the right side of the packet the actual canthus leaves and those will be really interesting to cut lots of twists and turns and also some interesting engraving lines that 
uh, you know, we'll have us blending technique. So it'll be a bit of piece by piece and bowl technique mixed together for those. So that'll be a lot of fun. But all of this in this video is pretty straightforward cutting. With a lot of these stems, I'm really working to try to get smooth flowing curves as much as I can. Again, these first couple pieces were a little rough, so not as smooth as I wanted, but you know, still passable. Uh, the second thing that you want to focus on on these types of interior objects are the really sharp points. And doing this in piece by piece really lets you to get razor sharp points. One thing you might notice is that I always start on the pull stroke of the saw because just like a traditional western saw, these teeth cut on the push orientation. So I always start by pulling. It's not totally necessary, it's just something that Patrice taught me so that's how I got used to it. This piece of the curve came out pretty nicely. just needed a little bit of shaving right there. The material itself is actually a curly sycamore that's uh, dyed. I got this from Patrick and Patrice. I'm not sure where they got it. But most of the greens, if you look at their work, um, most of that stuff is uh, material that they've dyed themselves using an incredibly complex recipe. A lot of these leaves where you see them end like that, where there's these two kind of sharp 90 degree corners, are where it, these stems are intersecting or flowing over or under other pieces, so that's where those transitions are coming from. One thing you'll also notice with a lot of these pieces are how thin they really are. I mean, some of these pieces, just like with the letters, the interior space is really only, you know, half a millimeter or something like that. So the tool becomes very important. It's really difficult to cut pieces this size and with this level of accuracy with a scroll saw. And I really like scroll saws, just not for work that requires this much precision. For this kind of stuff you really either need to cut it with a chevalet or with a handheld front saw or with a treadle foot powered overhead saw. It's really difficult to do this kind of work on a scroll saw.
A lot of times, really tiny pieces like this will just get obliterated by the blade. Now you'll notice here I've got a really tiny thin piece, so I've taken it and put it on the left side of the jaw to hold that and give it some background support where my fingers can't quite reach it. Not necessarily because I, I can't um, physically get my finger in that location, but because I couldn't quite get it there and actually give any kind of meaningful pressure in that position. Whereas now that I'm down a bit, I could move my thumb in there as you see and then pinch that, but before I just couldn't apply pressure there. So I was using that jaw. And so now I'm still using that jaw in conjunction with my hand to give as much stability as I can until I get into an area where it's a little thicker and there's a little more material supporting it. So I'm really taking my time on a lot of these as well, just because I really have to be careful with those fragile areas. So you can see with my, my left hand, I'm really pinching it hard, giving that support where it's needed as I start to exit the cut, so that nothing breaks off as I go. And this will actually help give a really sharp tip to this point. This is a situation where your left hand starts off in an odd position, something you do pretty often just depending on the packet, how things are oriented, what the shapes are. So sometimes you have to start with your hand in this position here, and then just transition over, no big deal. On these really swirly acanthus leaves where things are overlapping or going under, it can start to get really confusing as to what you're you're really supposed to be cutting. So it's it's important to take a minute and plan out the cut before you start each time so you don't start to cut the wrong line. Because it's really it's really disappointing to have to go back and recut the paper piece, reapply it, and then cut it again. So here you can see there's another tiny piece nestled inside of this one, but that'll be cut separately because this is piece by piece. So as I come around and I cut this piece out, it would actually take part of the line from the other. So I have to cut that one separately. That's that little piece nestled right in the center here. That kind of mirrors the piece that I'm cutting now. So you can see here how I'm using the right side of the jaw, and then how that paper can start to come off. So I'll just move it out of the way. I made a hole there so that I could turn the blade around and get a nice sharp corner there. So again, you know, using those jaws to help support the piece is really important. It just becomes a regular part of your work. So now I'm using the left side of the jaw to hold the area where it was previously cut, and then I'm getting to the end there, so I, I move the part of the paper that's coming off, and then I bring my left hand in to hold that piece. And then again, cutting with very light pressure so I can get a nice sharp corner.
And there you can see the paper got in the way, so I take my tweezers and just move it out of the way. And then I can finish my cut. Another hole, so I can turn the blade around. That probably wasn't totally necessary, I, I could have just continued on with that. But it does give a little sharper corner right there. There, I actually went back where I needed to turn a bit, so I saw up just a tiny more. And then I can start my cut. These long, gentle lines are nice because you can get through a lot of area quickly. Those are those are something that's really fun to cut. So I make a hole so I can make a nice sharp turn. Same thing over and over. Probably boring to listen to at this point, but it's all just the same stuff. Pretty much all the same techniques. I mean, there's nothing really new about any of this. Make the hole, turn the blade, start cutting. I remember the first time I saw Patrice's piece by piece packets and his holes were so tiny you can barely even see them. It was incredible. The efficiency and accurately that he turns the pack around is just incredible. So there I am using the jaw to add some stability again. the piece, finish the cut. If anyone has listened this far and there's any kind of technique or anything that's confusing that you'd like me to talk about, let me know. Because otherwise it's all pretty much just the same stuff. On this piece, uh, this is where as I turn around at the bottom, the paper starts to come off. So I do a little trick where I lick the uh, tip of my fingernail on my thumb and I press it into the paper. And that will sometimes uh, re-adhere the paper back down to the veneer well enough so you can finish cutting. And it kind of worked here. And again, this is really 
really thin stuff, so I'm trying to saw as carefully as I can and as smoothly as I can. It really is a good exercise in focus. You really learn how well you can focus when you're doing things like this, where you have to be just dead on. Okay, turn the packet, cut the sharp corners. And as I come around, I think this is where the paper comes off. Which is annoying, but you know, you get used to it. And again, I think it's because of the type of computer paper that I use and print this on. I'm gonna actually see if I can get a really thin computer paper for the next time I do a marketry project and see if that makes a difference. So there you go. So there you see it starts to come off right there. So I see it. So I lick the tip of my fingernail and I press it on there. So that'll kind of push some glue onto the surface. And it slightly works. It comes back off after a second, but it gives it uh, gives me enough to get uh, far enough in the motif to where I can actually finish cutting the piece so it sticks down enough of it so that I can finish the cut. So I'll press it down into place, make sure nothing moved, and then I'll usually blow on it for a second and then start cutting. You can give it more time too and it'll work better. It'll give more time for the moisture and the glue to, to work together to stick it back down. But you wanna make sure that you dry it off before you start cutting again. I can cut just enough to finish that section. So it's a useful trick, but hopefully one you don't have to use. And now it's at a point where I can grab the piece and give it some support. switch my position there so that I can see better. This piece coming up is the most difficult piece that I cut in this video. Definitely not the most difficult piece that'll be coming up in the next few, but uh, it does have one engraving line in it, and it'll come out, it's, it was supposed to come out in two pieces, it comes out in three because it broke in a fragile area where I thought it might break, but it didn't uh, influence any of the cuts, because it broke internally, and that's no problem at all. But so you'll see how I cut around it, and then I cut through that engraving line to separate it into two separate pieces. When you start getting into these complex pieces too, again, take a second and plan out the cut. You can't stress that enough.
So I come around there, that one has a sharp corner on it, so I make a hole. So I can come back, make sure that's a nice sharp tip on that leaf. Again, you can see how that paper wants to come off. So here I'm slowing down and trying to cut as carefully as I can because the area that I already cut is very close by and I don't want anything to break. I also know that I have a really tiny fragile area coming up so I need to cut accurately. So on this one you'll notice that the engraving line is right there in the center of the leaf. So sometimes with these types of interior elements you'll cut the engraving line first and then uh, come back and cut the rest of the leaf. That's really common. Here because I'm cutting piece by piece I need to keep the line on the left side of the blade. So if I were to go down that engraving line, which I can treat like a bool line where it doesn't really matter if I follow it exactly or not. You know, if I come around that corner after that, then the line will be on the wrong side of the blade and I would have to cut blind the entire side of this leaf that I'm cutting now. So you really want to avoid that. That's where the planning really comes in. So here I'm cutting down this side. The line is on the left side of the blade instead of the right, which would be a line cut. So then I come all the way down through to the tip and then I cut the engraving line. You also have to make sure to cut the engraving line at the right time. If you come through and you cut out that whole leaf and you get the end, and then you have to cut, cut that line, there will be nothing supporting it on either side, so it will be really likely to break out very badly. Or sometimes you'll go through and you'll cut it, and you'll forget the engraving line entirely because you waited too long and you left it for the end, and now you just have a, a piece that isn't going to have an engraving line after all. I did that once at school. I had one leaf, and I think it was one of the last few, in a really big project I was working on. And, uh, and Patrick has a, is a real stickler for technique, and so I took the leaf out of the tray, it was already cut, and I just like smashed it inside the jaws to give as much pressure as I could so I could cut the engraving line while it was outside of the packet, and luckily he didn't notice, but I, was, I had to do it in secret. Okay, so you can see I come around, there's the tip of the leaf that I make sure is really nice and sharp. Okay, I double check that I went far enough, then I can make my hole. And now I can start on my engraving line. So here, we're treating the engraving line the same way we would treat one on a bool piece. Because the interior elements are going to fit together no matter what because this line has no bearing on the fit of the exterior pieces. So here, I'm still following the line carefully just because that's the way I drew it and that's how I want to look. I want it to look, but if you were to go off the line a little bit, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. So here I'm just trying to saw as carefully as I can just because I like how that line looks and you know, I like how it was drawn. So you can see as I come through to the bottom, 
I finish off that line so it actually separates in the two different pieces, which is what I want because at the end, this leaf goes together inside the background and that interior engraving line gets filled with mastic and that becomes an, an accent. So that line is actually that I just cut is actually supposed to be visible. So you can see now the leaf is going to be separated into two different parts. And as I mentioned before, it broke right down at the, the thinnest point, but it didn't matter because it was a clean break. So it really should have been two pieces total. It comes out as three, but it's no big deal. Now here, as I get started, one thing you'll notice with a lot of people's leaves, if you look at them, at the tips, when they have an engraving like this, there will be a gap or a hole because they start to cut sloppily. So here you wanna be really careful and really intentional with your cutting so that you get a nice smooth clean cut at the tip of the leaf so you don't end up with a little hole right there at the top. So it can be kind of difficult, so you have to be very careful. I apply a lot of pressure with my left hand. I'm lifting up a lot on the saw frame and just letting the teeth graze. So you can see how little material there is on the left side and the blade actually supporting it. So you have to be very, very careful. So here, I'm really cautious about the turn because I'm trying not to break it. And now I can be a little less cautious because I'm going into an area where there's more support. Okay, so I'm coming around the corner, down into that area where it's really thin. And so you can see my fingers are really close to it. I'm applying pressure, I'm sawing well, but it still breaks. So sometimes you can be doing everything that you can and an area that you planned out is just too thin. There's just no way to know until you cut it. You know, that was planned out months ago when I was drawing it. I thought that would be enough material there, and there wasn't. But here, luckily, it was no big deal because it was a nice clean break, so it won't have any influence in the final picture. But, you know, sometimes that just happens. So there I'm using the, the tweezers to push it out through the back. And that is the nice thing about veneer and marsh pieces when they do break, is that when they come together in the final picture, if it's a clean break, it will be invisible. You won't see it at all. And in fact, sometimes I've seen uh, Patrice break leaves in half intentionally along the engraving line so that he can shade the interior of the leaf and then when he goes to glue it back down in the assembly board during the incrustation process you don't even see the break. I'm going to glue the hole and I can finish off that cut with my sharp corners. So this was the second most difficult piece. It had some interesting things going on internally that required 
lots of really tight, careful turning. Again, something that would pretty much be impossible on a scroll saw. And I don't mean to speak down about scroll saws because some people do incredible work with them, but I don't think you can do it quite with this design. I think you'd have to modify the design. And you'll see what I mean when I, once I get in, inside the piece here and I turn around that outside edge. And that's really what the Chevrolet allows you to do. It's also what an overhead foot-powered saw, similar to a Chevrolet, will allow you to do. You have to really be able to control that blade. Or you can cut everything as double bevel marquetry on a scroll saw, and it'll all fit nicely. But again, you won't be able to get really, really small details like this. That also, that also becomes kind of a question of time too, because here I'm cutting out two copies at once, but I could do eight, eight of copies if I wanted to. Whereas if you were to do a picture like that in double bevel marquetry, you'd have to cut it each time and layer and layer and layer, and it would be um, just a huge amount of time invested to cut uh, your marquetry pieces. So, you know, you kind of weigh things and trade them off. So it, the cutting here might take longer to do it uh, for one piece, but since I'm doing two, I'm saving a lot of time. I also don't have to deal with the constant layering of going back and forth, sand shading and gluing things into the background. And I just get to sit here and cut everything out and do it all in stages and that saves a huge amount of time. Okay, so I made my hole there and I'm coming around the sharp corner. So in t inside of this acanthus leaf here, because this is part of one of the acanthus swirls, there's lots of little swirly hooks that come off the leaf little tendrils and things. So I'm having to, to saw very lightly and very carefully. And here's also where my, my uh, saw stroke shortens up and that's actually okay for stuff that's this small and this detail oriented. That's something I talked to Patrice about. He said it's okay when you're cutting really small stuff like this to shorten up your stroke so that you can actually accomplish the cut. Okay, so you see I'm slowing down, pinching tightly, and controlling everything. So I have a tiny, tiny corner I'm coming around here. Actually a tiny little part of the leaf. And there's a bit of a curve to it. It curves out, then curves in and then the tip flares, so that's why I'm turning out here as I make my hole, because I was actually making my hole kind of as I was finishing the tip of that portion of the leaf, and then I can come back down the other side of it, so I take a second and I'm planning out what to do next. So I bring my left hand in to give some stability as much as I can. You can see how unstable it is though with uh, the cut that I've already accomplished, you know, cutting away any support it may have had. So here I'm actually stopping before um, I continue the cut to make sure that the background veneer is uh, hasn't crumbled away, that everything is, you know, exactly where it should be, so that as I come around this corner, nothing gets snagged. Because I felt that the background veneer was starting to lift just a little bit, so I was making sure it was all pushed into place. Okay, so as I come around here, there is almost a microscopic little uh, portion of a leaf 
that of the leaf that juts out. So I have to plant it really carefully because it juts out and it also has a sharp tip. So I have to curve around, cut up to the tip, then make a hole, turn the blade, and then come back down the other side of it. So here I have my finger, my my thumb and my index finger pinching basically right over the area I'm cutting. So you can see how I'm actually bringing the level uh, my eyes down to meet the line. So I'm actually kind of looking under my finger while I finish that. So I'm cutting a little bit, stopping, looking, cutting a little bit, stopping, looking. So here I'm turning the blade around. I'm trying to use the jaw as much as I can to add support. Okay, so that little tiny portion is cut. Now I can finish off the longer arc inside. I'm still using my left hand to really support everything that I've previously cut. And then try to end, lift up the pressure, speed up the cut. Get a nice sharp corner. So that was some difficult cutting. There's going to be a lot of that coming up. You can see those acanthus that are still on the packet. So that's where I'm going to sign off. Uh, the rest of this cutting is pretty straightforward and simple. Nothing too wild. So after this, I imagine the next three or four videos will still be cutting the campuses.